Thank you. If there are um, people on the hall, come on in and let's shut the door and get started. Taskmaster here. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Elizabeth Silver and I'm chair of the Northampton Democratic City Committee and I'm delighted that we could have this event tonight. A number of candidates were interested in speaking with our committee and they are all here and this is fantastic. So thank you to all of the candidates that are here who will be introduced in a little while by our mayor. And we give them a very big thank you because I know they come all the way out here. And those of us in Western Mass, I've said this to some of the candidates, I'm sorry I'm repeating myself, but we know it's twice as far to get from there to here as it is from here to there. So we are particularly grateful that you're here. Thank you so much. Um, the agenda tonight is quite simple. The candidates are going to be speaking in groups according to the race. The first group of candidates will be Attorney General, then um, Lieutenant Governor, and then Treasurer candidates and they've chosen straws numbers to determine the order in which they're going to be speaking. Um, David will be introducing that. They have... <laughs> ah, okay. <laughs> that makes me hungry. So um, they have up to five minutes. That's what they've been told. And we have a very gentle timekeeper here, Jim Nash. Okay. He loves flexing his muscles, and he's going to keep everybody to their time frame. Uh, just uh, housekeeping, the bathrooms are down the hall, first right, and then the bathrooms will be on the left. Uh, Northampton Dems, please stick around. After we're done with the candidates, we've allowed about 15 minutes. People can just mingle, talk to, talk to each other before we proceed into the rest of our business meeting, um, and then we will hopefully get through that in not too long. Don't forget our caucus for Northampton is March 1st. The surrounding caucuses that have not yet been held are on the back of the programs that we left on the chairs. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce our esteemed mayor, David Narkowitz, who will introduce the candidates. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, Elizabeth and the Northampton Dems for organizing tonight's event and obviously for having the great wisdom to schedule it for tonight instead of tomorrow night because uh, we'd probably all be shoveling our driveways. Um, I want to also just acknowledge some local elected officials that are here uh, this evening. Um, uh, the sheriff, uh, Sheriff Garvey, is or was here, uh, so I know he was here for a we also have some uh, Northampton City Councilors here. Ward 3 City Councilor Ryan O'Donnell is here. Uh, Ward 6 uh, City Councilor Marianne LaBarge is here. Uh, we have a, a trustee of Forbes Library, Marjorie Hess, is here with us tonight. Uh, and we also have uh, uh, an esteemed former mayor of Northampton, uh, Mary Claire Higgins, is with us tonight. So we're going to just uh, go through the order as they were drawn. And so the first candidates that will be speaking are the candidates for Attorney General. And by order of the draw, the first candidate we'll hear from tonight is Maura Healy. Good evening. My name is Maura Healy. I'm a Democrat running for Attorney General. It is great to be in Northampton. The very first weekend of my campaign, I came here. And I've been here a few times since, and I'll keep coming back. It's actually great to be back at this school. Uh, my best friend and, and her family moved out here a couple of years ago, and I remember shooting hoops with her boys uh, behind here uh, just this past summer. So thank you for having me here tonight. I am running for Attorney General because that role has never been more critical. That is an office that touches the lives of every individual, every family in this state. And I know that firsthand because for the last seven years, I've been in that office, leading teams, leading initiatives, and making a difference in ways small and large for people here in this state. 
Your next Attorney General is going to be responsible for making the legal decisions and judgments for 7 million people in this state. And I want to use my experience as a lawyer, as a leader in that office, and as a person with passion and commitment to the public interest to do that job. Now, many of you know I've never run before. And so I spent a little bit of time telling people who I am. You know, I grew up in a small town. Um, my mom was um, a school nurse. My dad was head of the teachers' union and taught high school history and coached sports. They raised my four younger brothers and sisters and me. Um, and we all attended public schools. After waitressing my way um, through high school, uh, I went down to, and, and actually through, through college, that's how I came to Harvard College um, and came to Massachusetts. I um, studied government there and I did play basketball. As some of you know I had a professional basketball career overseas before I finally grew up and returned to law school. Um, but I always wanted to be a lawyer from the time I was very young. I wanted to be an advocate. And when Martha Coakley was putting together her team in 2007, I made the decision to leave private practice. I went in private practice and worked at a law firm for many years after law school. I had a lot of debts to pay. But the pro bono work that I was doing on the side wasn't enough. And so when I had the opportunity to be hired as Chief of the Civil Rights Division in the Attorney General's office, I jumped at that chance. From there, I uh, led the case of uh, building the state's challenge to the Defense of Marriage Act. It was a case that people thought was not winnable, um, but I knew it was a matter of fairness for 40,000 spouses in this state who didn't have access to health care or Social Security or retirement benefits in the same way as other married people. And that was wrong. And that was an example of what an Attorney General can do. Putting together the challenge, the first successful challenge to that law. And after, that, after winning that case and standing in, in court and arguing that case, we saw other suits brought and we saw dominoes fall around the country. And that's the kind of Attorney General's office you all deserve. You know, I led the fight uh, in the office to take on Wall Street banks and to hold accountable mortgage brokers who stripped equity from families and communities across the state. But it didn't stop there. I oversaw and designed a program that's been game aimed at keeping people in their homes, stopping unnecessary foreclosures. And by having advocates in the office work directly with distressed borrowers, we've been able to negotiate loan modifications with banks and stop foreclosure auctions. Thousands, tens of thousands of people in the state have been helped through that program. You know, on issues of disability, it's an issue I care deeply about. Um, a while ago, I met a young kid named Kyle. He came into the office one day and he told me this story about um, this new technology on campus that Apple was making. And the great thing was is that Apple made this technology that was delivering content through iTunes for him in school, but he wasn't able to access it because he was blind. Sometimes the Attorney General is about lawsuits and subpoenas. Sometimes it's about picking up the phone. I picked up the phone. I called Apple. We got a nationwide agreement to make their technology accessible for people with disabilities. That's an example of what an Attorney General can do. That's the kind of Attorney General I want to be. I love being in this, this part of the state because it's so beautiful, of course, but you know what? Its values, its progressive values resonate with who I am and who I want to be as an Attorney General. Because under my watch, you will have an Attorney General who's there to stand up for individuals, safeguard communities by working in partnership with others, and lead an office guided by fairness, accountability, and innovation. You will have the best prepared, the most effective, and the most progressive AG's office in the country. Thank you for your consideration and your support in caucuses and at the convention. Thank you, Maura. The, uh, our next candidate uh, for Attorney General is Warren Tolman. Thank you. Good evening. It's nice to be back in Northampton. Uh, you know, a great resident of Northampton is back in the hospital, Tim Carpenter. He's a dear friend of mine. I hope you'll keep him all in his prayers. He's doing fine. He has a flu, but he's, uh, you know, he's had a long health battle, and I hope you'll keep him in your thoughts and prayers. Um, I, uh, 
spent a lot of time out here. I went to Amherst College, and my son just graduated from Amherst College, so I'm no stranger to this area. It's nice to be back here. I'm running for Attorney General because I believe there is no other office where one can have the tremendous impact affecting the lives of ordinary citizens of Massachusetts. I want to tell you a little bit about myself and how I think I'm going to be a different type of leader. Uh, I grew up in Watertown, I'm the seventh of eight kids. My mom and dad started our family in a federal housing project in Boston. I was the first to go to college in my family. Went up the street at Amherst, right up Route 9. Uh, in fact, I think I had my first strawberry daiquiri at Fitzwillies many years ago. Uh, it's a great spot. Um, road crew right here on the uh, Connecticut River. and have had a lot of fun in this area. I love this part of the state. Uh, one of the values that my parents taught the eight of us was to stand up for what you believe in. Sometimes, even if you're the only person standing, you stand up because of something that you feel strongly about. That's one of the values that I feel is most important in electing your next attorney general, your next leader, your next advocate. Specifically, I took that value to the Massachusetts House of Representatives and the Massachusetts State Senate. When clean elections was, was up, and there was no one else willing to run for it under the public financing system on a statewide basis, one guy did it. I did it because I thought it was very important to try to get the pernicious influence of big money and special interests out of the political process. I was proud of that. I eventually got the money. It was too little too late, but I'm proud of fighting that battle. The last meaningful campaign finance and ethics re reform piece on Beacon Hill, I was the chief sponsor. When Big Tobacco was at the height of its power in the mid-90s, nobody had beaten them in 20-plus years up on Beacon Hill. I took them on. We banned the sale of cigarette, single cigarettes. We started the, the, the uh, campaign against smoking in public buildings. And I filed a bill which was a national model requiring tobacco companies to disclose the additives and ingredients and have accurate nicotine yield ratings. In fact, if you know nothing else about me, you can remember that Rush Limbaugh attacked me on national radio, <laughs> called me an anti-smoking Nazi, so I can't be all that bad, right? I'm willing to take on those battles because it was, I was willing to take on those battles because it was the right thing. And as a progressive leader in the House and in the Senate, I fought for early childhood education. In fact, those license plates that are still out there, the Invest in Children's license plates, I was the chief sponsor of. I have one on my card and have since they started. Those are the types of values I want to bring to the Attorney General's office. Let me tell you specifically about something, one thing I want to do. Today's version of big tobacco is the NRA, in my opinion. Nobody, no politicians are willing to take them on. You know, there's iPhone technology which allows you to open up an iPhone with your fingerprint. Smith & Wesson, right down the road here, had that same technology readily available. Wanted to have it, but the, the rest of the manufacturers in the NRA started a boycott, so they backed away. The technology has been shelved. You know, every hour of every day, a young child is rushed to the hospital as a result of a gun accident in their home. <coughs> there are 1.7 million unsecured guns across America today. This technology can save lives. And the Massachusetts Attorney General under Chapter 93A can force the sale of new guns to have that technology today. I know what that means. I know it means taking on the NRA. I know it means taking on some tough battles. I did it with big tobacco. I'm going to do it again. I'm going to do it with cyber crimes under Chapter 93H because there's not enough regulations that are controlling the use the data breaches that are all too often happening. And I have a lot of other issues that I want to work on. I have a hard time. I have two daughters and one son. I have a hard time when I think about it. On average, my two daughters are going to make 77 cents on the dollar as my son. I think that's unfair. And I think we need to work on that issue. And there are a lot of civil rights issues that I want to work on. There's public, public protection issues in the Public Protection Bureau, the Bureau that are very, very important. I also was proud when I ran for governor to be the only candidate endorsed by the two environmental groups that endorsed in that campaign. I'm going to fight to make sure that we, we have a push towards renewables to make our to make our state once again a leader in this fight. The governor's been way out in front. I think we can do better, uh, and the Attorney General can help lead that fight. So I ask for your consideration. I very much appreciate the opportunity to speak with you here tonight. And uh, whoever you support, I know one thing. On September 10th, 
I hope we're all together because the issues that unite us are much, much more important than the few issues that might divide us. Thank you very, very much. Thank you very much. So we'll now move over to the uh, candidates for lieutenant governor. And uh, under the drawing order, uh, the first candidate to uh, address us tonight uh, for lieutenant governor is Mike Lake. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. My name is Mike Lake, and I'm a candidate for lieutenant governor. And as I tell people across the Commonwealth, I'm not running to hold an office. I'm not running to, to sit in an office or for a title. I'm running to make a difference. A difference in the lives of the people that we all care most about. Our friends, our family, and our neighbors. See, to me that means delivering on what I call the Massachusetts promise. The promise of high quality education. Jobs that pay a livable wage. And safe communities for our kids to grow up in. That's the promise that my family survived on. See, my, my mom was uh, from Everett, my father from Malden. Both of them graduated high school, but neither one of them had the opportunity to pursue higher education. Shortly after graduating from high school, my father decided to start his own business, an air conditioning company. Now, he knew at the age of 18, nobody in their right mind would actually do business with him. So he named his business Edward H. Lake and Sons. <laughs> And that public education, public school education that he got and that savvy uh, businessman mentality that he had gave him that little break he needed. And he built that company over the next 18 years. Now, tragically, at the age of 36, my father went to bed one night and, and never woke up. Left my mother with a five-year-old son and a three-year-old daughter. She became a single parent overnight. And in a heating, ventilating, air conditioning company she knew very little about. My mother, again, with just her high school education, had the level of skill she needed to take on that business, to keep it afloat for a couple more years until she was able to get rid of it. And then she was able to work all kinds of jobs to make sure that my sister and I had the, the life she wanted us to have. They kept a roof over our head and kept meals on our table. Every parent wants that for their child. But tonight in Massachusetts, 4,000 families are homeless. They don't have that roof over their head. They don't have a bed to call their own. And 29% of those families, 29% have a working adult. It is unconscionable in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, in one of the wealthiest states in the, in the country, in the wealthiest nation on earth, that we would have working parents that cannot provide a roof over their children's head, and food on the table three times a day. But it's happening right here in the Commonwealth. And we have some opportunity to do something about this. To lead again, as we did with gay marriage, as we did with health care. We have an opportunity to raise the minimum wage and not stop there, but continue to focus on creating jobs that pay livable wages. So what's my vision for the Lieutenant Governor's office? It's to work with our mayors and, and our city officials to make sure that they have a liaison to the governor's office so that they can build their economic, their local, their local economies. To be a liaison to our legislators because it's building those relationships that gets things done on Beacon Hill. But they're also our, our pulse, of, of keep our finger on the pulse of what's happening in Massachusetts. And finally, to be a liaison to the world outside of Massachusetts. You see, every one of our constitutional offices is focused on the day-to-day -day operations of the Commonwealth, as well they should be. But we now operate in the 21st century, a global economy. Massachusetts needs to compete in that global arena, and we're not doing it now. We need to be out there aggressively selling the rest of the world, letting them know that Massachusetts is the best place to bring their business, the best place to bring their investment, the best place to create new jobs, to put our unemployed back to work, to strengthen our economy, and to create a larger revenue source so that we can and we will start investing in the things that we really care about, education and infrastructure, chief among them. We need a pipeline of education from early childhood straight on through to retirement so that every child is ready to learn when they enter primary school and that every adult who loses their job can get the skills training they need to compete for jobs in the 21st century. 
This is my vision of the lieutenant governor's office. This is my vision of the Massachusetts. I'm asking for your help, your support. For those of you who are going to your caucus and, and on to the convention, I'm asking for your vote. And all of you, I'm asking for your support in September. Together we can turn this around. We can make sure that the Commonwealth, Massachusetts, is the best state in the country to make sure we compete in the global economy. That we have the resources we need to build the education and the infrastructure to keep our kids competitive in the 21st century. My name is Mike Lake. Thank you all for coming out tonight. And be careful in tomorrow's storm. Thank you. The next candidate we'll hear from is James Arena De Rosa. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here in Northampton to talk about the Arena De Rosa campaign for Lieutenant Governor. I know I missed some events last year, but I just left the Obama administration where I worked with schools and small farms and health clinics around the region, making sure that one in four Americans had enough food to eat during the greatest recession of our lifetime. I was the lead Obama administration official for all food, nutrition, and ag issues. I'm from Massachusetts, lifelong Red Sox fan. Grew up in a working, middle-class, second-generation immigrant family. Worked my way through high school, worked my way through Harvard. My sisters and I were the first in our family to graduate from college. I grew up in a home where we were taught to make a difference in the lives of others. And all I ever wanted to do was be a voice for the people who didn't have a lobbyist on Beacon Hill or Capitol Hill. At Oxfam America, I actually created an advocacy program that took community issues and placed them before policymakers. During the Clinton administration, as the lead a person for Peace Corps here in New England, I sent thousands of American volunteers around the world, not only to serve overseas, but to build their own skills. We now live in a global economy, and the face of Massachusetts is changing as we speak. And cultural competency is going to be a critical life skill for all of us in the months and years ahead. Now, my heart will always be in the community, and I will always be accessible. But rest assured, I am comfortable in the corridors of power. At USDA, I negotiated with governors and cabinet secretaries. I testified before legislators. I worked with mayors and municipal leaders throughout the region. I led a senior team that ran 15 federal programs. I am the only candidate in this race that has administered a $12 billion annual budget. But I've also served on my finance committee, and I've also worked in state government, so I understand that really important relationship between the cities and towns of the Commonwealth and the state and federal government. And being that bridge and being that voice and advocate was what I want to be as Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts. I also want to contribute to the future of the Commonwealth. I have three areas. One is around food, hunger, and nutrition. I also think in schools we need to promote the education of the whole child. And as a former SEIU union member, I'd like to see more fairness in the economy. If you work full time, you should be able to take care of your family. Given our time constraints, let's focus today on food and hunger. We have learned so much about how the food we eat impacts our health. And we could be saving the Massachusetts economy, both public and private, billions of dollars in long-term health care costs by promoting better nutrition and healthier lifestyles. At the same time, we could create thousands of jobs in the local food economy by providing the right kind of support to our small farmers and our food processors, and we have some right here in the meadows in Northampton. Now, you may be shocked to know or learn that Massachusetts ranks 48th in the country for school breakfast. Yet every mom and dad and school nurse and teacher in America knows a hungry child cannot learn. I promise as Lieutenant Governor I will work and fight for universal breakfast in every elementary classroom in Massachusetts because we know that kids who have breakfast do better in school, have less problems with discipline, and by the way, will do better on those standardized tests. <coughs> now hunger for me is not some abstract concept. I've seen it firsthand. That year with all the snow and with a bunch of school kids talking about what did you do on your snow day and they were all excited to tell me. But one little boy was being kind of quiet as a former Little League coach, try to get kids involved. I said, well, what do you do on your snow day? And he looked at me, and then he looked down, and he said, well, I really don't like snow days because I don't get to eat anything during the day. Why am I running for lieutenant governor? There is not a day that goes by that I don't think about that kid and kids like him across the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And I'll tell you, this is not just happening in poor communities. My middle-class town of Holliston our food pantry is oversubscribed. 
My wife runs the senior center, and people who run senior centers across the Commonwealth know that there's seniors who struggle and choose between medicine and food. How can this be in this great country of ours? We can do better. Economic justice, promoting the education of the whole child, ending hunger while creating jobs at the same time. If those values are important to you, I ask for your support in this campaign. I ask for your support from my campaign for Lieutenant Governor. My name is James Arena DeRosa, and I'm running for Lieutenant Governor because I believe we live in extraordinary times that requires our sacrifice and the very best of what we have to offer the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Thank you very much. Good night. So our next candidate uh, is uh, all the way from Waitley, Massachusetts, Jonathan Edwards. Thank you very much. I, I first want to take the opportunity uh, to point out my wife, Katie, who's in the back of the room. It's wonderful to be in a room where I have family. I also want to thank all the candidates for all the statewide offices that have come all the way from different parts of the state. It's payback time. <laughs> As the mayor pointed out, I am from Waitley, Massachusetts. I, my family has lived there for 30 years. I am Western Massachusetts. And make no mistake about it, when I am Lieutenant Governor, I will come home most nights and put my head on a pillow in Waitley, Massachusetts. My wife went to Amherst College, and I have a lot of relatives who went to Amherst. My mother and grandmother went to Smith College, and Mr. Mayor, I'm going to correct you, there's one other local elected official that I want to point out. The co-president of the Smith College Democrats is here tonight, because they're the future of the Democratic Party, and we can never forget that they are the future of the Democratic Party. And it's why education has to be one of the top priorities that we have. I talk a lot about Western Massachusetts on this campaign trail because it is so important to me. I'm running as the only candidate for statewide office who lives in Western Massachusetts. I cannot forget about it. I think about it every day. I'm a 10-year, four-term member of my Board of Selectmen. I serve on the Western Massachusetts Climate Change Advisory, Cha uh, Advisory Committee. I serve on the Knowledge Quarter Consortium. I'm the president of the Franklin County Selectmen's Association. Every day that goes by, I work on behalf of people from this part of the state, and that means something. As a select board member, we saw a problem with our senior center, and we worked to fix it. I worked together with other select board members from across the region to fix a regional senior center that was broken with councils on aging that weren't playing well in the sandbox together. It was unconscionable to have four or five seniors come to that senior center on a regular basis. And today, we have 50 or 60 people attending that senior center on a regular basis. And it's one of my proudest accomplishments because I worked together. I built consensus because that's what I do. Back in 1991, I had the opportunity of a lifetime to work for Paul Saunders on his presidential campaign. And if nothing else, and I'm a disciple of Paul's, make no mistake, but if nothing else, he taught me about consensus building, about partnering, and about collaborating to make sure that we solve the problems that we face in this state and across this country. That same approach was successful in the 1991 special election that elected John Olver to Congress, which I was proud to serve as one of his first staff people that was hired. And we had a great run with Congressman Olver. Consensus building is what Western Massachusetts thrives on and depends upon. As a select board member a couple years ago, we saw a broken ambulance service in my town of Waitley, in the towns of Deerfield, and in Sunderland. We were missing 40% of our calls, and we were relying on Northampton, Springfield, and other cities and towns in the region for mutual aid. People were waiting 45 to 50 minutes to have an ambulance respond to a 911 call. It's called a lost opportunity. When you're having stroke-like symptoms or you're having chest pains, 45 minutes is 
literally perhaps a lifetime, and certainly figuratively. Consensus, consensus, consensus. Professionally, I am someone who spent 12 years, the past 12 years, working to expand clean energy and energy efficiency, the clean tech industry, across Massachusetts and across this state. We are so thirsty for jobs in this state, and make no mistake about it, the next jobs revolution in this state will be in clean tech. The Patrick administration has done a great job as a leader on clean tech, and we need to make the 90,000 clean tech jobs today turn into two, 300,000 clean tech jobs. And finally, the people of Western Massachusetts need to remember that we have a population challenge around here. The population projections have us losing, Northampton losing 10% of its population by 2030. East Hampton, 5% by 2030. We need to grow our middle class because only by growing our middle class will we bring back the population of the Western Massachusetts and, and bring back the manufacturing base and truly give people the greatness in this region that they deserve. My name is Jonathan Edwards. Jonathan Edwards in Northampton, by the way. I would appreciate your support at the caucuses and at the convention. Thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. The next candidate we'll hear from is Leland Chung. Thank you. I want to uh, just start by thanking all of you for coming out tonight, and especially to all the volunteers from all the campaigns uh, for investing so much of your personal time to making democracy work. Uh, I've got to know a few of you, as, as they look around the room, from my work on the Democratic State Committee as an executive committee member, and as one of the people that was charged last year with drafting the Democratic Party platform uh, that we adapted at the last convention. Uh, but for those of you that don't know me, uh, I'm a husband, a father, I'm the son of, uh, son of immigrants, and um, I've been serving uh, for the last four years as a Cambridge city councilor. All the accomplishments uh, that I've had in my life, I owe to my father and the community. My father actually immigrated in 1969 from China to Massachusetts to pursue his education at Boston University. So I, have, I experienced firsthand the absolutely transformative power on ed of, of education on a parent's ability to provide for their kids. And in my own life, I've experienced the transformative power of education to have a kid reach their full potential. You know, I've, um, I've served since, uh, since my education, I've invested in Massachusetts companies, I've been a successful business person investing in clean tech, in innovation, in uh, internet infrastructure, in mobile, and all these uh, different companies in different fields uh, had one thing in common. They were creating jobs in Massachusetts, they were helping the community, and they were creating opportunity for people that live in our society. But as much as I was investing uh, in Kendall Square in the innovation economy, I wanted to be investing in the people that lived and worked around me. So in 2009, I ran for and was first elected to the Cambridge City Council. And since then, I've earned a reputation as uh, one of the most progressive, productive members of the council, fighting to increase funding for education, uh, fighting for pre-K, standing with organized labor to demand a living wage from some of our largest companies in our community, fighting for infrastructure to, and investments, Chapter 70 and 90, which I'm sure you all know about, from Beacon Hill. But the one thing I learned, the most important thing I learned serving the Cambridge City Council, is what it takes day to day to run a city. And the city mayors, the city managers, the councilors across the Commonwealth deserve somebody in the corner office that understands the day to day struggles of delivering services to residents. The residents of Massachusetts deserve somebody in the corner office who understands how the, the decisions made on Beacon Hill affect the 351 cities and towns across the Commonwealth. We've had tremendous leadership from Governor Patrick over the last seven years. His investments in innovation, in education, and in infrastructure have put us on a road to success, and Massachusetts is set to take off. And I know this personally because I've been, I've, been I've been appointee by the governor uh, to our economic development agency. So I know firsthand that we need to continue investing in infrastructure so that the innovation economy doesn't just stay in Cambridge and Boston, but expands throughout Massachusetts. I know that we need to continue investing in what we've been doing in broadband so that schools like this don't just have a single DSL line going to them, but that they have high-speed internet so that kids growing up anywhere in the Commonwealth 
to compete with kids, in not just Cambridge, but kids across the world. And, um, you know, I'll say, that, I'll say another thing. We're going to face a difficult choice in November. You know, the Charlie Baker that we ran against uh, seven years ago is not going to be the same Charlie Baker that we're going to face this year. And you think we have a tough race amongst, you know, five lieutenant governors and the AGs. It's actually you that's going to have a tough choice convincing the rest of Massachusetts that we can't go backwards with Baker, a man whose greatest legacy was the big dick finance scheme, which put us back decades in terms of investment in our infrastructure. We need to move forward. We need to double down on the strategies and in investing in education and infrastructure and education that Governor Patrick has led and that we know will be successful with the right people at the helm. You know, a lot of us have talked on the campaign trail about uh, raising the minimum wage and decreasing the income inequality gap. Well, I know that the way, the question is how you do that. And the question is continuing to follow that is, is investing in infrastructure, that the innovation economy isn't just on the eastern part of Massachusetts, but it spreads throughout the western massive part of Massachusetts. We need to work with universities and community colleges and vocational schools so that every single person in Massachusetts has the access and the tools they need to get a living wage and a good job, whether they have a four-year degree or a two-year certificate. And I know that I am the best person for Lieutenant Governor to continue that because that's been my life's work. My, my life's work. I've benefited from the transformative power of education. You know, I've invested in the innovation economy here in Massachusetts with the governor. I've worked to spread the innovation economy in Cambridge throughout the rest of Western Massachusetts. And I'll close by saying, you know, when my father immigrated here in 1969, he had a dream to try to one day provide his kids with a better, better life than, than he left. And I feel that, that same pressure now with a five-month-old daughter at home. And I'm asking each of you to join me in realizing that dream, and not just for me, not just for my daughter, but for families and people across the Commonwealth. Thank you. My name is Leland Chung, and I'm running for Lieutenant Governor. Thank you. And our final candidate uh, for Lieutenant Governor is Steve Kerrigan. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'm sure there are uh, many wonderful words you've heard tonight, but the final candidate for lieutenant governor has to rank up there as some of the nicest words you've heard so far, right? <laughs> Aren't you? Uh, mostly because you want to get on to the good treasurer candidates. Um, uh, my name is Steve Kerrigan. I'm running for lieutenant governor. Uh, it's great to be back here in Northampton, uh, and I was thinking on the drive out here, we had one of our funnest days on the campaign so far, um, which I've been campaigning for over a year. Uh, out here for the Pride Parade, we actually uh, created a potential disaster for us, but we, we worked out pretty well. I was coming around the, the first turn on the parade, you know, right after it starts, and we were walking along, having a good old time, and somebody flags me over, and she introduced me to her wife and her two kids, and she said, hi, how are you? You know, what can you tell about me, me about you? And I said, well, if I'm elected, I'll be the first openly gay lieutenant governor. And she said, in the country? And before I even thought, I said, yes. And then I went back into the middle of the parade, and I leaned over to a guy on my team and I said, can you Google that and make sure I didn't just lie to that poor woman on the side? It turns out it's true, but uh, I just wanted to make sure we, we verified that before I spread, uh, spread the word. But, uh, you know, I'm, I'm thrilled to be here. I, I'm running for lieutenant governor because uh, the next governor needs a partner uh, who has experience at all levels of government, who has worked with the business uh, community, has worked in the nonprofit world, uh, and who really understands uh, how to uh, solve problems here in, in Massachusetts and across our country. Uh, that's what I've done my whole career. I was a, a selectman and a finance committee member in my hometown of Lancaster uh, for a number of years at a time when we were just moving out of the early 90s recession, trying to restore some of the cuts that we had to make to, to services uh, that, we, that we provided to our citizens. It was a difficult time for us. I also served as the, uh, the uh, chief of staff to the attorney general here in Massachusetts when we had an opportunity to sue the George W. Bush uh, administration's EPA in the United States Supreme Court and win on the issue of climate change. Uh, and prove to them there was actually an issue that needed to be addressed that was uh, really hurting uh, because of their regulations were hurting uh, the good people in New England uh, and the country. And I had the chance to work for uh, the late, great uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, uh, who I worked for for 14 years and counted as a, a mentor and a friend um, uh, even today, uh, who taught me more about not just legislative process and things like that, but what it's about to represent a community and people and to their values and to fight for them each and every day. And that's what I want to do as Lieutenant Governor. You know, we, we all have our two-minute version, our three-minute version, our five-minute version. Every candidate here has the, the, the different version of what type of speech they're going to give. And uh, I was, after the caucuses on Saturday, my partner and I went out to dinner <coughs> uh, and we're chatting for a few minutes and I was lamenting 
how hard it is to be a candidate because, you know, we've got such a tough life. And uh, <laughs> you should pity us all. Uh, and I said to him, I said, you know, it's so hard to summarize your entire life in two or three minutes uh, to try to convince a room of people uh, to, uh, to support you. And without even thinking, he wasn't trying to make a great grand point. He looked at me and he said, what do you think unemployed people do every day? You know, they sit across the table from a total stranger and they try to encapsulate everything they've done, who they are, their training, their life experience into two to three minutes, because we all know that's what the first impression is in, in those meetings. Uh, and he said, that's what folks fight through every day. Uh, and that, that, that moment was so, made everything so clear for me, uh, uh, why we need good people in government. We need to keep fighting for each other, because we're all in this together. Uh, you know, I, I've never been a burden with an involuntary lack of uh, employment. Uh, my partner will point out I currently have a voluntary lack of employment, uh, <laughs> but I have never been, been, been burdened with an involuntary one. Uh, but I know what it means to represent those who have, and I want to work hard with the people of Massachusetts. I want the next governor to appoint me to, to chair a competitiveness council that will look at all aspects of life here in Massachusetts and make sure that we're making Massachusetts the most competitive on the global stage that we can. Uh, everything from broadband, which I worked on when I worked for Senator Kennedy on, on net days, because in 1996, Massachusetts was 37th in the nation in network classrooms, and in 18 months of volunteer work and working hard uh, all across Massachusetts with maybe many of you, uh, we moved from 37th to 16th uh, in, in the country, and we would have done better had the rest of the, the other states tried to catch up with us as well. Uh, but those are examples of, of things that community can do together. You know, I, I, uh, I want to be lieutenant governor because I love this state. Uh, this has, the state's given me every opportunity I've ever had in my entire life. Uh, my parents uh, raised the three of us out in Lancaster, Mass. Uh, I am, I, until Jonathan got in the race, I was the furthest west uh, of, our, of our candidate, so he took that one from me. So I don't know what, yeah, we'll come up with something else. Um, but, uh, but I did, you know, my folks are both union members, uh, and I got 30 seconds. My folks are both union members. Uh, when I was a little kid, I thought I was the luckiest kid in the whole wide world. My, my father was around all the time, and uh, we always had pancakes for dinner. And uh, which I love pancakes, and I love having breakfast food for dinner. And it wasn't until later in life that I realized it was because uh, that was all the strike fund could afford. My father and his brothers and sisters, the utility workers, had been on strike three times before I was five years old. And uh, I just wanted to mention that because if it wasn't for people like you in rooms like this all across our Commonwealth and our country for decades before, and hopefully with your help, decades to come, fighting for the principles of the Democratic Party and what we all believe in, I wouldn't be here today. So uh, just as a, as, a, as a candidate and a Democrat, frankly, and as a son, uh, thank you guys for all that you've done for the Democratic Party and all you do. I appreciate your vote at the convention and in November. Thank you. And September. Thank you, Steve. And now we're going to switch to the candidates for treasurer. And our first candidate to address us is Deb Goldberg. Welcome, Deb. Thank you very much. You know, I, this is not the beginning of my stump speech, and since I do have a timer, I'm going to say it quickly, but it's absolutely true. You have the three month, the five, the three minute, the five minute, the eight minute, the 12 minute. And I was just sitting there the whole time while everyone else was talking, saying, what am I going to say? Because it really is difficult to come out and see a group of people, and how do you convey sincerely and honestly who you are and what it is you're trying to do because that is what I would really like to be able to do tonight. I have the business background and the finance experience and the local elected leadership experience and the nonprofit experience to do the job at the treasurer's office. But that's not really why I'm doing it. I'm doing it because economic security, economic empowerment, economic stability is a personal mission of mine. You know, I said to someone here tonight, I ran for lieutenant governor in 2006. I'm going to be 60 years old in May. It wasn't on my bucket list that I needed another statewide race. So I must be sincerely passionate about what I can bring to the treasurer's office. You know, I have a Harvard MBA. I went to BC Law School. I was an executive. I was, I've been, the, I'm the president of an adoption agency. I was chairman of the Board of Selectmen in Brookline. I have the skills to manage the $55 billion pension fund. I have the skills to manage an area within 
within the government, which is the treasurer's office, that is eight departments. I have all of those business skills and those finance skills. But what I have that's more important is I bring my values to the table every single day and have ideas and plans that will make this treasurer's office make a significant difference in people's lives. My vision is more than a four-year term. It's eight, it's 12 years, because having worked in government as much as I have, I know that in order for us to get things done, we have to stay at it, we have to have laser focus, we have to push it through, bringing all the right people to the table. I was chairman of the Board of Selectmen in Brookline. I was a liberal before I was a progressive. I think there are probably others in the room that can say the same thing. I was Michael Dukakis's mascot when I was, he ran for state representative in 1961. I grew up in a family where business, our values, and progressive values and political activism were not incongruous. It goes all the way back to my mother's great-grandmother when she came over with her 11 children and started a little store that everybody could work in. And everyone who came over behind them had a roof over their head and a job. That company grew into Stop and Shop, which is where I worked. Where I worked as a union member in 1445, where I became an executive later on. And what she also did was made sure that everyone else was included. She and the ladies in the neighborhood started a home for the agent, and it's those values. When I stand in front of the spot that she arrived in, in the north end of Boston, I know that she is who I am, because that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. What is my vision for the treasurer's office? I talked a little about the technical jobs, but in my treasurer's office, we will institute wage equality. It can be done. It can be done without hurting any men because wage equality is not a woman's issue. It is a family issue. I was with a gentleman in Winthrop two weeks ago, a father. He has a wife and three daughters. He said, it is my issue. I will institute a robust financial literacy program, not a grant program. And I've already put together the team to begin to get that done. That's why I say more than four years. So these are the kind of things that we can do when we take on a job that's so important and also make a difference in people's lives. When I look back on my career, I know that I will be like that woman who at the turn of the century knew it wasn't just about her and her family, that it was about all of us, and that government has a role to play in all of this. So I look for your support, I look for your vote at, at the convention, and I hope to engage you with us in this travel through the state. Thank you so much, and I hope that you will be supporting me at the convention in June. And I look forward to coming back. The next candidate uh, will actually be hearing a representative of, of the campaign of Tom Conroy, and that is uh, Gabe Frumkin, who's here representing uh, Mr. Conroy. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Gabe. Uh, I am Tom Conroy's field and political director. Thank you for having me. Um, Tom wanted to send his regrets. Tom is currently a state representative from Wayland. He's been a state representative for eight years and uh, the House of Representatives was in session today and Tom needed to vote. He wanted to vote on a bill that uh, increases funding for youth violence prevention programs by $5 million and gives funding to the Department of Children and Families, uh, an additional funding for 150 more social workers. He's been working on those issues since uh, he was a representative, since he first got elected eight years ago, uh, so he needed to do that, uh, but he was looking forward to being here. So to tell you a little bit about Tom and why I'm supporting him, Tom is a state representative. He's currently the head of the Labor and Workforce Development Committee. So in his day job, he's working very hard uh, to pass a minimum wage bill that guarantees 
uh, Massachusetts residents get a full and sustainable living wage. Uh, this is very important to him. I can tell you, I, you know, part of my job is getting him from place to place every day, and he is always working appropriately hard on that, but it's kind of a frustration to me. Um, <laughs> some of his um, other accomplishments as a state representative is he's worked very hard in financial issues, uh, such as by increasing, um, uh, by passing legislation that helped uh, increase our uh, credit ratings so that we have AA ratings saving Massachusetts taxpayers millions and millions of dollars in terms of interest. He's also increased our ability uh, as municipalities and localities to have good investments uh, by giving our pension funds access to the state uh, investment managers. Um, but this is all great. He's also been a, uh, <laughs> he worked in financial services for 16 years before uh, he was elected to the House. Uh, he worked with state agencies to save them money to find what he calls non-tax revenue to help save us taxpayer money. But the reason that I support Tom and the reason that I hope you uh, check him out, visit his website and so forth and end up supporting him is uh, from something that happened when I first met with Tom uh, a few months ago. And what that was was we were talking and he was sharing all these treasure ideas uh, which are very hard to understand, especially when you don't have very much finance background. And he was explaining to me why it was important to find forms of revenue and to save money through creative ways that don't cut services to Massachusetts voters. So he was talking about uh, the pension and why it was so important to fulfill our commitment to public service workers, um, but to fully fund it. And the reason he said was that he didn't think it was right for uh, the state to take out millions and millions and billions of dollars in loans uh, because what that meant was that Massachusetts taxpayers would have to put our taxpayers, uh, our money, to Wall Street. And what that showed for me was that Tom has the fairness and the sense of principle and also the experience and vision to understand that there are problems within our economy and to correct them and to work over the long term and over many years to make sure that we have a fair economy that works for everyone and that affords people uh, the opportunity to succeed equally. So again, uh, please do support Tom Conroy. He's running for state treasurer. He's a state representative from Wayland. And uh, he'll make it out here uh, as soon as I can get him here. So thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, our, our final candidate uh, for treasurer this evening is uh, Senator Barry Feingold. Thank you, Mayor, and thank you for the great work that you do for Northampton. I want to thank all of you for staying here, listening to all these great candidates. My name is State Senator Barry Feingold, and I'm running for State Treasurer. In my personal life, I work for everything that I have. In my public sector, public sector career as a selectman, as a state representative, as a state senator, I fought hard for increasing the minimum wage and fighting for financial literacy because in our state we have way too many people losing their houses to foreclosure and way too many people going into bankruptcy. And as your next state treasurer, I'll work hard every single day to protect all of your taxpayer money. I come from a family of two public school teachers. I didn't grow up a rich kid, I didn't grow up a poor kid, I grew up a true middle class kid. So I learned early on in life that if I wanted anything, I had to work hard. So at a young age, I had a paper route. Then when I wanted to go to college, during the summers, I'd unload trucks at 3 in the morning, helping to pay for my own college. And then when I went to law school, I worked two jobs to go to law school at night. And when I started my own law firm, I scraped together every nickel and dime that I had to start this business. So I understand about finance, I understand about running the business. But at the same time, when I was in college, I got inspired by a young governor from Arkansas to get involved in public service. And I thought I was going to go to Washington, but I was set, my mentor sat me down and said, if you're serious about helping people, you've got to go back home. And home for me was Massachusetts. So I served as a selectman, as a state rep, as a state senator, and I've worked on some great issues. And as your next state treasurer, there's a couple of things that I want to get done. First thing is I want a pension fund that reflects our values. I believe we should divest from fossil fuels and get a pension fund that re reflects investing in clean technology. I also want a lottery that works for people, not against people. I've always been against gaming. I think it's wrong for our state. As Democrats, we should be against it. 
and I don't want I don't want to expand lottery by giving people the option to use credit cards to buy scratch tickets. I don't want to have online gaming where you can play Kino online. That's not to me economic development. And lastly, I want to create jobs by using our pension funds to create jobs here in Massachusetts. But I think there's one thing that you should be asking all candidates, whether running for treasurer or lieutenant governor or any other office. When their backs are against the wall, will they stand tall for the values that all of us believe in? I just want to tell you a quick story about something I experienced. I was a young freshman state representative from the town of Andover. Now, Andover is not Northampton. It's a very purple community, and I, I won that seat by a whopping eight votes. Got the nickname landslide finally. It wasn't because of my overwhelming success. So I knew I was going to have a very difficult time getting reelected. I was maybe in office for maybe four months, and unfortunately there was a gruesome murder of an eight-year-old boy, and people were angry, and people wanted revenge, and there was a big push to reinstitute the death penalty. Now, I never voted on this before, and there was a lot of pressure. And then right before the vote came up, I got a call. And they said, Barry, we know the vote's going to be very close. And if you vote for the death penalty, we're going to get all of our friends, all of our neighbors, do everything we can to help you get reelected. But if you vote against it, we're going to get all of our friends, all of our neighbors, do everything we can to beat you in the next election. So I had a decision to make. Remember, I won my town by a whopping eight votes, so I knew I had to have a tough re-election fight. But I knew in my heart the death penalty was wrong for Massachusetts, and I voted no. But what I didn't know, when the final vote came around, when all the tally was all said and done with, it would be 80 to 80. It would fail by one vote. So I said to myself, at least I had a couple good months at Beacon Hill. I better go find a new job or something like that. So I worked hard. Re-election was coming up, and I didn't know how I was going to I was how I was going to do. But I remember election day. I was standing out in the polls, and a guy came up to me. He said, "Barry, I am so angry with you about your vote on the death penalty." And I said, "I know, I know." But then he said to me, "I voted for you." I said to me, "I said to him, you voted for me." He says, "Yes, because you stood on principle. You didn't do what you thought was politically easy to do. You didn't do what you thought was going to get you re-elected." You did what you thought was right. I would go on that day to win by 66% of the vote, the largest the Democrat has ever won the 17th Essex District. And I learned a lesson that day that you stand tall. And throughout my career as a legislator, I stood tall for gay marriage. I stood tall for health care rights. I stood tall for green communities. And the three weeks ago, I voted to make the minimum wage the highest in the country. If you give me the chance, I'll always stand tall as your next state treasurer. Thank you all very much. Thank you, thank you to all of these great candidates. We are so fortunate as Democrats to have such a great uh, set of candidates. So please give them all a big round of applause. And I will now turn the meeting back over to uh, to the chair, Elizabeth Silver. We're going to actually have a business meeting, but if you have any other uh, announcements. Thank you again. Um, why don't we take about 15 20 minutes and mingle, and then the Northampton Dems, I know it's getting late, but let's just do this, uh, come back about 825, 830, and we'll finish up, okay? Thank you, all the candidates, we really appreciate you.